Welcome to the fifth episode of the Snowboard Instructor Podcast. I hope you're doing well and enjoying the episode so far. This episode, we talk to Melon, who is an evaluator and part of the national technical team for Cassie. We talk to her about her story, the biomechanics of snowboarding, and topics of equality and Cassie itself. Alongside this, we have a sponsor for this episode. Watch and Ride is an online snowboarding school which focuses on improving your ability no matter what level you are. With loads of quick tutorials and feedback from high level instructors, you're bound to improve not just your technical ability, but also your knowledge. They also have a fitness program to help maintain your fitness for next season of shredding. As we all know, lockdown has made us a bit lazy. Visit Watch and Ride and use the coupon code Snowboard Instructor Podcast for 25% off your order. We hope you enjoy this episode and have a great day. So yeah, first question. Um, yeah, let's talk about the history. So your first snowboard lessons are the first time you've put a snowboard on to like, those first trips, essentially, and evidently be, be get, becoming involved in Cassie. Uh, yeah, definitely. So I'm one of those lucky Canadians that grew up really close to a ski hill. Um, so my local ski hill was just on the Quebec side of Ottawa. Um, and it was probably not much bigger than, uh, than a snow dome and definitely way colder and way icier. <laughs> um, so I grew up skiing there. Um, and, um, my, my cousin got a snowboard for Christmas. We've seen snowboarding in like Warren Miller videos and thought it looked really cool. Um, what Craig Kelly was doing on a snowboard with like big, wide open yeah. uh, turns, dragging a hand. Craig that, Kelly. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> Craig yeah. Kelly was just like, that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to make those big, wide open turns. And, you know, I'm like, oh, I'm a pretty good skier. Um, I was in mm, grade school at the time. And uh, so yeah, my, my cousin got this uh, snowboard. It was called the Crazy Banana. It was black with uh, pink and fluorescent yellow on it. Um, and I tried that out. I couldn't get up the handle toe, um, but the bindings were so big that they didn't fit my feet. So what would happen is I'd stand on the, the board, hold on to the handle toe, which is like a drag lift, and I would get pulled forward, and then my feet would come out of the bindings. <laughs> My first experience on a snowboard. So that didn't go very far. Um, so the, I guess the next time I tried a snowboard as soon as I could was I rented a snowboard that actually fit my feet or at the time I thought it fit my feet. Um, and uh, yeah, so basically then I put, put it on and I went up the lift cause it was like, Oh, handle toe. I don't want to use that. Uh, had bad experiences. So I went up the lift and um, I think I probably fell off at the top and then you know, figure I'm a pretty good skier. I've seen all of, you know, Craig Kelly's videos. I've seen all of this stuff in the media. I've seen Hey Hackinson throwing down. I'm a good skier. I can do this. Pointed the board straight down the hill, tried to lean from side to side, caught an edge, flipped upside down, had a bad time. And then was like, I don't understand. And then um, my cousin who'd figured some stuff out was like, oh yeah. Okay. So you just go sideways on your heels. <laughs> <laughs> so it did. <laughs> and thus started my uh, first year and a half of snowboarding where I was a heel edge bandit and I went everywhere on my heel edge because heel edge wall, yeah. why would you want to do anything else? Like, mm -hmm. the, this is fine. I can go left. I can go right. And I love this thing. And I, I really did. Like, I really loved that. It was fabulous. Um, I went down to the U.S. on a family trip and they were uh, teaching lessons. And so we took a lesson and that totally changed things. That was... Um, I had a fantastic coach who basically uh, had me holding onto like a stick with two hands to make sure that I would turn my whole body wow. and not just kind of like halfway flail getting onto my toe edge and then send it. Um, and that was fabulous. So I learned to turn and had my first lesson. And I really wish I'd had a lesson in the beginning. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, and then that was it. I thought the lessons were the, the best thing. Um, going up in my little mountain, similar to the snow dome, where you can see everyone like coming down the hill, right? You're right there. There's no like in the trees or anything like that. If there's a couple of trees, it's sparse and you can see through. Mm -hmm. So the best snowboarders on my mountain were snowboard instructors. And these guys could just 
turn a snowboard. They're out there on plates. They're out there on softy boards. They're laying it over. They're doing the great big Craig Kelly carves, mm-hmm. but they're, they're doing it on like Quebec downhill sheet ice. Yeah. And they're making it look amazing. And I, I just wanted to be like that. So mm-hmm. um, I would split the cost of a private lesson with my dad um, to take lessons with uh, the best snowboarder at our mountain, the snowboard director. Um, and, and they were, they were awesome. They were so good. Like got us going, got us going. And so as soon as I could, as soon as I was old enough to, I wanted to sign up for my Cassie one. Oh, so no. it did. So how did you, how did you, um, find Cassie where it was essentially all the instructors there Cassie qualified, I'm guessing. And then it was just, um, talking to those instructors and, and, um, kind of, um, having a, having a chat and seeing what you want to do. Um, did you essentially, um, get your certification on, well, the 11 one, where did you kind of do that? Was it on that local home mountain or did you have to go and do it somewhere else? I was really lucky. There was a certification right at my home mountain. Um, if I'd had to go anywhere else, they would have all been just like 10, 15 minutes down the road. There's a little cluster of these, these little tiny local hills. Um, but I, I didn't have to, for my level one, there was a, an instructor who came in from one of those mountains and ran a, ran a level one at my local hill. Mm. Um, yeah, so that was, that was great. Um, super fun. My dad came along too. Um, cause yeah. you know, I had to use a credit card and didn't have one of those at the time. <laughs> so, um, and that was great. Um, mm. and then when I, uh, when I took Cassie, when I started, um, you had to be 19 to take your level two. All right, I had to be 18 to take your level two. So I waited and waited and waited and taught and taught and taught and taught, taught tons of beginners. It was fabulous. Loved it. It was on the hour and a half. Uh, it was called an intro surf lesson because in French, um, you know, snowboarding is the surf de neige, um, yeah. although not really so much anymore. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, so when I turned 18, I could take my level two and I had to travel um, to a uh, quite a bit farther away mountain um and take my level two uh so it was about an hour's drive uh every day back and forth um from my house to get my level two great and then kind of going from the level two where where did you actually do your first like ski and snowboard trip by the way oh so um i'm lucky i'm so lucky i'm canadian and Mm -hmm. so (laughs) Right. So there's there's so many options. So my my family is skiers. My grandfather was a skier. Uh, my dad uh, passionate about skiing. So they skied for a long time before like they had kids, uh, my mom and my dad. Um, and so my first ski trips would have been to my cousin's uh, ski chalet in Mont Tremblant in Quebec. Oh, wow. And then how was how was that actually like that first ski trip um, kind of there? With- I don't remember just so small. <laughs> I would have been I would have been um probably about five or six um on that first trip. And I have like blurry little kid memories. We used to go there every year for March break. Yeah. And I have blurry little kid memories of those uh those first trips, right? So <laughs> yeah, it, <laughs> you just know, kind of, like, it just kind of washes past you having too much fun. You 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 just in that's the it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So as I started getting older, um, we would go a little bit further afield. So we'd go um, more into Quebec. So we go to like um, Mont Saint Anne um, mm. and the Massif. And then we started going down to the US because again, those are still driving holidays that, um, that Canadian families can do. So um, it's not that far from Quebec down to, um, uh, down to like Vermont, New Hampshire and Maine in the US. And so we would drive down there. Uh, my first snowboard lesson was actually at um, in the States. It was at Stowe in Vermont. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And, uh, and then my first Western holiday, so the first time I got on a plane to go snowboarding, was in Sun Peaks. Hey, nice. How was, how was that as a first like, snowboard trip then, if you, can, if you can remember that? Yeah, I totally can. That mm-hmm. was amazing. Absolutely mind-blowing. Um, terrifying. Mm. I didn't realize that when you touch down in like a place like Kamloops or here in Kelowna, that it's okay that there's no snow in town. There will be snow in the mountains. <laughs> yeah. My experience is if there's no snow in your backyard, there's no snow in the mountain because my backyard and my mountain are really close together. Yeah. <laughs> so 
I remember the trip up being like just so worried that there wasn't going to be snow. Mm. Um, yeah, that that was that was not the case. There was amazing snow. There was uh, big snow ghosts uh, up at Sun Peaks. The powder was incredible. Um, and and I was on my snowboard. I'd um, I have pictures of that. I. Um, I'm in my my snow school uniform because my home mountain was so small that you had to buy your uniform. Oh, really? And that was all the money I had to buy a uniform. So there I am in a like, I felt like a rock star in my like awesome avalanche instruct ski instructor uniform because <laughs> snowboard instructors can have their own. But yeah, that was my first Western trip. It's full of all of these like branded ski vorlage <laughs> instructor uniform. Um, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Um, yeah, and then kind of g- going from oh, sorry, um, yes, yeah, so, and then kind of going from that that first um, first trip, moving on to the level two. Did you do some instructing after that? Kind of have after having that level two and going to uh, a resort, or did you kind of stay into your home um, home kind of town locally? Yeah, well, my hometown and my home resort were the same thing, right? So I used to teach um, evenings after school. So I taught as a part-time job all the way through high school. And then I taught on weekends. So yeah, evenings and weekends. And then um, getting my level two, um, I was, I got my level two. And then I, the next year I went away to university and found myself a local hill that I could teach at. And so I kept teaching because I could make a lot more money teaching as a part-time job and it kept my soul alive. Mm -hmm. I tried not and I tried not snowboarding and that didn't work out very well. And I, I just, I loved it. So I would teach by the end of my university days, I was teaching Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and I was coaching a coaching board cross team. I was doing a bit of competing myself. Mm. Um, and then I realized that I could make more money. Um, in, if I took a winter semester off and taught, than I could ever make trying to figure out a summer job. Mm. So then I flipped my, my winters around and I went out to Sunshine Village. Um, and worked part time while I was in university. And was that? I'm guessing that was, of course, um, um, instructing as that first season. How was that? My first season, so like my 16 year old season. Yeah, yeah. You, if you remember. Yeah, that. yeah. Yeah, I totally remember. <laughs> it was amazing, and I was a terrible instructor. <laughs> I'm really sorry to anyone that I ever taught when I was 16. I I'm so sorry that I tried in 90 minutes to get you to turn. <laughs> Big apologies to everyone that I taught in the night. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was amazing. It was awesome. Like, well, those it was so busy. We had we had like five or six instructors, and we had lessons all the time. Those groups were really big. Um, we didn't have any one footing. We didn't have a lift that was snowboard compatible. The T bar has more slope sideways than it does uphill. Oh, that's and which sends you off into the woods. So really? wow. snowboarding, we taught it by walking up and sliding down. So for the first half an hour of your lesson, you walked up, slid down, walked up, slid down, walked up, slid down, all two footed, no one footing, just up and back down again. And the big rush was to try and teach people to have enough direction control that we could take them up the, the two person chairlift with a terrible suicide lift drop off at the top. It all fall. And I was so unforgiving of like any of them falling. I probably didn't even slow the chairlift down. Actually, I definitely didn't slow the chairlift down. And then we would skate them around the corner and then put their snowboards on and try and teach them direction. And then by the end of the, the run, try to teach them to turn. Mm. <laughs> I'm sorry. It was awful. It was all the bad things, but we guaranteed <laughs> that people would learn to turn in 90 minutes. I bet having that um, kind of experience though, from going from something so manic and all that going from, to, to those later seasons where it was a bit more kind of chillaxed, hopefully, and you had time to be able to, teach people how to like properly snowboard instead of just kind of rushing it out but I bet that was like so rewarding so much like easier for you as well I think it took me a long time to and it took snowboarding a long time to realize that turning isn't the be-all and end-all so I think that (laughs) thankfully I was doing what everyone else was doing at the time (laughs) and teaching like rushed and then we've uh, as snowboarding and as snowboard instructors, we've come a long way to realize that turning isn't the be all and end all of, especially of your first day. And then it's probably going to take you about three days to learn and really own the fundamentals. 
so that you can actually learn to turn. Yeah. So, you know, when I'm teaching instructors, I try and really strongly encourage them that in a based on a half day product that they're probably want to look at convincing their students that it's going to take them three days to learn to turn, mm. yeah. you know, day one, heel edge, day two, revisit heel edge and toe edge, day three, make sure everything's good. And then your first turns should be amazing and pain-free mm-hmm. rather than here, let me hold my hands and hold your hands and like whip you around and develop some bad habits. Yeah. And kind of going um, from there, when did you kind of start to think about being, being in the CASI system, being like, you know what, I can probably go for these higher levels. I, I feel like I could, I could probably go up in the system and, and see where it goes, essentially. Oh, like, oh, I'm sure, pretty sure that like walking out of my CASI level one with my pen and my piece of paper, I'm like, what's next? <laughs> um, I had every intention of getting my CASI three, my, my friends in ski school. Um, who are the, you know, the ski instructor that I took, or the snowboard instructor that I took my first lessons from that I'm still in touch with today. Um, They, you know, he was going for his level three. Um, She was also like, ended up going for level three. At the time, there were only three levels to Cassie. And that was it. I was like, I'm going to get that. Yep. You know, absolute, absolute confidence. And that's carried me a long way. It's been, it's been great. (laughs) It's just like, yep, I can do that. Um, and so yeah, in, in every aspect of things, it was like, um, and probably not always the best approach. And I, again, probably wouldn't advise it for, for any other people, but it was like, as soon as I would get a certification level, I'd be banging on the door of the next one, yeah. taking the courses, failing the exams, taking the courses, failing the exams. That's, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> definitely and how was that level three actually um kind of going into it as a as a course itself um so it was it was a lot of fun it was um an amazing experience so I um narrowly missed out on being grandfathered into the level three process so at the time I was an evaluator a level two and a race coach and if you were an evaluator a level two and a freestyle coach you got grandfathered Uh, so Mm, yeah. Um, and that, you know, I don't even remember it sucking at the time. I think I was just stoked that we went from three to four levels. Mm. Um, that was exciting. Um, and getting to be the first batch that was going through the the level three was amazing. It was, I had, it was the first time I had access to some of the best um, Cassie evaluators around. I had the technical director at the time, as well as one of the interscheme scheme team members and the first female um full cert snowboarder in the Canadian system the one who was the champion for women and the champion for all sorts of programming like um so I had those people as my evaluators and that was an incredible experience oh amazing um, and, and what did you kind yeah. of do after the that level three course what was on the agenda then so after the level three course oh well I only got half of it the first time because you know go for a certification <laughs> fail part of it <laughs> And keep going. So, <laughs> so it was a course and exams all in one. Um, and then I went back for my retest that same season and uh, was pretty stoked because I did knock off that other that uh, other piece of the level three um, mm-hmm. and got to meet more cool people um, and make more neat connections. So that's one of the other things on Cassie courses. This is a couple of people that I've, I met on that course that I, I stayed in touch with for years as well. Okay. Um yeah, so so really cool. I never underestimate the art of going for a course and meeting all the people on it and then keeping in touch with those guys. Yeah. Um, but yeah, after the level three, that's when I um, I went out uh, to moved out and did my last semester of not quite semester of uh, a winter semester of school and university, uh, as well as snowboarding and teaching full time at Sunshine Village in Alberta. Oh wow! Nice. And that was great. Because as a level three, I could make much better money than I could working some random coffee shop job as a university student. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Right? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Everyone's had that kind of second job, haven't they, in terms of trying to kind of make it up with the season (laughs) and making money's just. Well, I think it's that it's almost that university, like, I can't make any money Mm. in my hometown trying to 
trying to work a summer job, but I have this awesome winter career that I've been working on for so long. And there's a ski school that wants me for the winter. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. And you're going to pay me that hourly rate. That's amazing. That's a job I couldn't dream about getting in the summer as a uni student, but as a winter, as long as I shuffled my schedule around and went to school in the summertime, that worked great. And how was that season itself actually um, in Alberta? It was fabulous. Absolutely fabulous. I spent most of it upside down with no idea how to handle powder. Um, (laughs) um, But, you know, just, um, I was actually just snowboarding with one of my buddies that I used to work with. He's still a Cassie evaluator. And we were chatting about that season and, you know, it taught me the mountain. I learned Sunshine Village inside out and backwards. So I could have a blast with my, my Cassie evaluator candidates, um, over this past week, you know, all the, all the tricks, all the areas that it wind loads, how to get from here to there. Mm. I learned all that, you know, it stored all that, that all the way, even if I couldn't ride most of it at the time, now <laughs> I can ride it. <laughs> and, and now it's fun. And how was, um, I, I kind of just backtracking in terms of the evaluator course, actually, um, because, um, how did that kind of work in terms of, so it was before doing it, you at level three then, um, yeah. And how, how did that work out? I mean, in, in terms of that. That was incredible. Um, so I um, started evaluating Cassie courses 20 years ago. Um, and I, so I did my first, first evaluator training, um, went and then uh, met, traveled quite a distance and met people that I'd only read about in the Cassie newsletter. Um, it was like meeting Cassie celebrities. It was awesome. <laughs> um, it was fabulous. Got the chance to interact with um, people from all over my region that had similar passions and similar ideas. And that's what I really love about evaluator training is that, yeah, it's, it's a distance. It's, a, it's an expense. It's, it's tough to, you know, research that every year, um, for all of my evaluators. And I, I don't, um, I definitely see the the struggle of it, but the actual physical aspect of getting a group together every year, year on year is an incredible experience. So again, I've been doing that for 20 years and I, I love it. And I see the value in it. Um, even this, this time around, even if we were in small groups and we didn't have that great big sort of social aspect of getting together or switching evaluators, we got into groups and we stayed in our groups the whole time. There was still the chance to network with my little tiny, my little tiny group of people that I, you know, waved to and said, see you next year, or maybe I'll see you if I'm in your resort running an exam. The value of training is amazing and it's it's a big effort because we hold the evaluator training only on canadian soil yeah um but it's worth it's worth coming to as an event planning on if you're planning on evaluating um you know you get you get some really good education it's continuing education every year designed towards running courses um but it's an amazing experience and yeah so we're trying to expand that a little bit. We've had member sessions running concurrently uh, with evaluator training in the past. We couldn't do that this year. And then this year, we've also added in something that's called a trainer update. And so, yeah, so uh, Cassie level threes or uh, level twos from smaller mountains are able to come out and join in on a day of trainer update and get some of the same rider improvement ideas, get some of the teaching updates, get some of the Cassie updates as the trainers do every year. So, um, so I think that's a really cool program that I hope to see grow in the future is to have this sort of trainer update and people being able to come to this who want to take, who are working at the top of their, their ski school. Cause goodness knows we have a lot of really small ski schools in Canada um, you know, there's 300 ski hills in Ontario alone. There's another, you know, 250 in Quebec. Um, there's, you know, all the ones in the prairies and they're all like this big, this, this teeny tiny, like, <laughs> teeny tiny, itty bitty. Um, and they all have trainers and they all have people that are passionate about turning left, turning right yeah. and teaching. So those kind of events are going to be really amazing as the evaluator training work moves more towards, um, uh, job related training, but, you know, having events around that, I think is really neat. Um, and getting more people involved in those kind of events early and seeing the value, I think is a really, 
really good thing for Cassie and really good thing for our members. Absolutely. Kind of moving from that uh, level three then, um, going into when Cassie first started their level four and you kind of going on to that. How was that course itself? Um, and of course, did you do anything like modules or or courses like in between that level three and four period alongside maybe doing some after? Yeah, uh, I did. I took my race coach level two, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, learned a bunch that helped me set up well to be on my carving board on the Cassie level four and then charged straight into the level four. Nice. Completely unprepared. Uh, <laughs> the whole thing i know actually i didn't i passed my bumps um so once again walking away with like i got one thing um yeah totally unprepared for that one um what really prepared me to go back to the level four was moving to the u.s and working in uh vale beaver creek mm. and learning to teach um like all day lessons and learning to teach uh longer and spread out my lessons a little bit more so everything wasn't jammed in there yeah. Um, I also took my American three while I was down there as well um, for my ISA stamp. And that as well set me up to look at learning a little bit differently. So taking the, um, uh, the PSA ASI uh, three instructor course, I, I learned a lot and started thinking a little bit more critically about the way that we were teaching and the structure of lessons. Mm -hmm. And that set me up really well for uh when I came back to Canada three years later, taking a much more mature, mature attempt at the, the level four, that's for sure. Oh, wow. And ha in terms of going from that, because you did your PSIA um, and of course um, going to New Zealand as well um, after that and kind of doing the Rookie Academy, how was that in terms of going to, was that like your first international trip or was that kind of? Um, no, actually. I did, um, I did five years in Australia wow. um, teaching. Yeah, so right after I, right after uh, Sunshine Village, I went directly, well, we closed the 24th of May and I was on snow in Australia on the 1st of June for my first Australian season. Um, wow. It was a bumper Australian season. It was probably like sort of one of those seasons where it's like the best snow in a, like a decade, but mm -hmm. I had no idea that that was it. And I thought this was what it was every year. And I kept going back after that. <laughs> <laughs> loved it absolutely loved it I love back-to-back -back seasons and so launching the the Cassie courses in New Zealand with Rookie Academy is getting to do what I really love which is to snowboard all year round mm. um yeah so um it's been neat again like I was really curious about the Australian system when I was working in Australia I came along to some of their uh trainer updates as well as a a guest trainer um, and someone who helped out with like the hiring clinic at my mountain Mount Buller. And uh, yeah, so that was, it's been really neat to see those international perspectives. What's the um, sort of, for example, what's like the differences between the two? Like, oh man. Um, I mean, just, I know it's probably tons, but. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think that, you know, I think all riding aside, you can have long discussions and most people have long discussions about yeah. the riding I think what I would like to highlight is the difference in the teaching, um, the teaching systems. Okay. So teaching wise, both the, um, the American system at the time, a couple, just a couple years ago. Um, and, uh, and the, the Australian system is that they teach very, um, package based lessons. So this idea of like, here's the, here is the lesson at this level. Okay. Yeah this particular little box of a lesson, can you reproduce it? And in Cassie, we do that in level one, but we don't continue that up through the levels. As you know, we start to um, teach you the tools that you need to be able to construct a lesson well, rather than like some kind of reprodu reproduction and then mm -hmm. you can add your own flavor as needed. Mm -hmm. So... I guess the difference is, you know, um, you know, Cassie's a, you know, gives you a, a recipe book, which can be frustrating for our candidates as they move up through the levels. They sometimes would like that a little bit more of a, yeah, I think especially when you, you know, start. this is what you teach. Yeah. Um, but seeing the value in that as well uh, and being able to have more versatility, it definitely served me well when I was down in the States going, oh my goodness, 
what do you mean? I have the same person for like two weeks and I've got to teach them six hours a day. What am I going to teach them? Cassie set you up really well for that because you're like, dude, there are five skills and there are like lots of different places we can take those. That's at least a couple of lessons. Yeah. That's so good. And actually kind of let's move on to the, like the next segment then in, in terms of your like involvement in Cassie at the moment. Um, so you are part of the national technical team. Is that correct? Yes, that is. Um, and what's your, your kind of main current role in, in, in the national technical team, if you would like to kind of um, able to kind of give that a description? <laughs> Yeah, I guess. Um, so we are a seven member team that uh, works collaboratively, collaboratively together, um, along with our um, uh, national technical and education coordinator um, to basically uh, look critically at our uh, standards and uh, teaching content um, and writing content to maintain the standard of um, instructors across the country. Mm. And around the world in all of the different countries that we run casting courses in. Um, and so we're basically critically evaluating, you know, what we've done in the past. We look at all of the feedback from all of the courses and we, we make sure that we are moving in the directions that we want to move. Um, every four years, there's a, a big international Congress of uh, ski and snowboard teaching systems called Interski. And that's a really good chance to bring instructors together to present the ideas that other systems are going. And we get to evaluate, uh, are we, as Cassie, where we want to be? Um, are we, you know, using best practices uh, in teaching in our, our particular environment and environments? Um, and are we uh, staying on the cutting edge of uh, snowboard teaching in the world? And right. so... Yeah, uh, in reality, it looks like a whole lot of um, emails and Zoom calls and long chats about uh, about things. Um, lots of lots of like input back and forth. Um, but yeah, there's a it's a it's mostly a lot of like long email chains. Um, but what we get out of it is a system that is continually evolving and driven from uh, um, international uh, input as well as really driven from inside our membership we take what our members contribute to us really seriously and we continue to drive uh it towards the best we can be for our membership oh great so actually kind of going from that question itself um especially from interski kind of comparing even though you are using in inputs from different kind of associations what is like the comparative differences and similarities um, between kind of Cassie itself? How does it kind of stand out in the crowd? Um, yeah, compared to all the other kind of organizations out there. I think what's been really nice to see over um, a couple of interskis is how much, um, how much a lot of the organizations that teach snowboarding are really coming together and we all stand around on this, the hill and we go, yep, yeah, yep, yep, we do that too. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, totally. We do that too. Um, and that I think is a, is a really neat thing. Um, we get a lot of respect, um, internationally, um, from the other organizations. Our groups are usually really big, um, to the point where, you know, we've had other nations sort of, uh, they're like, Oh, there's no one standing at our, our workshop today. We'll just go with, we'll just go with the Canadians. <laughs> um, <laughs> So that's been really good. It's really nice to get that respect. I hope we're still, you know, we want to continue to earn that. But what's been really good is that we all, when we put out something, everyone's like nods their heads and goes, yep, yep, we're doing that too. Um, so I think that that's a really nice thing to see is, um, is uh, organizations coming to the same ideas. We're all teaching the same, the same thoughts, the same ideas. And if you think about that, that's, that's probably pretty much correct. I mean, the only differences between different nationalities is maybe the kind of snow and the slopes that we're standing on. But we're all humans. We're all snowboarding. And we're all teaching. And teaching is pretty fundamental. So if we're doing the same stuff, hopefully we're getting it right. Yeah. 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 I think, is it also, would you say, as you go higher up in the sort of to more performance level of teaching, then would that differ slightly or sort of still again roughly remain, yeah. remain the same or differ the a lot? of those higher levels is where we really differ so it's it's always a tough call about whether or not 
you base your highest level evaluations on say like performance outcomes. So looking at where the snow meets the, um, meets the snowboard yeah. and looking at what's going on there. Or if you look up higher and you look at like how the body is being held athletically to achieve those performance outcomes yeah. and, and which is the picture we want to do. Are we just going to look at the snowboard and allow messy stuff to happen up higher? Well, or are we going to look at, you know, that perfect body position and what's happening at the snowboard and the snow interaction is just like, whoa, you know, <laughs> eye blinding kind of idea. So it's a really tough evaluation um, to decide whether or not you're going to evaluate based on how it looks or how it performs. And I think that's the big key difference in, in the evaluation systems at those higher levels is to sort of understand uh, which way they're going to have to go because you can't evaluate on both. You got to decide one way or the other. You got to put some weight on one way or the other. Yes, you, you can evaluate on both, but you know, you have to, there has to be some decision made or some way to create some evaluation. And I think that that's, that's where our systems really differ. Yeah. Could you, is there, as we said, like you could find a middle ground in between. So some say someone far end is saying, oh, okay, um, it's mainly the board doing this. Um, so let's look at that. Then the other side saying, okay, maybe it's your posture or something. Could you not find like a middle ground between the two? So it's oh, dude. Doing this if thing. you find the middle ground, can you tell me about it? Because we're all trying to find <laughs> And no one's found it yet. But when you find out, <laughs> yep, yeah, let's go. We're all looking for it. But how we get there or how we try and get as close to middle as we possibly can. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Damn. <laughs> I, I think then it's just uh, when you're looking at it, it just seems like the words is just depends, depends on the person, depends on the rider. So yeah, it's a yeah. it's in it's a yes or no answer. Yeah, <laughs> Isn't well, it's not a yes or no answer. Sorry. Yeah, no, it's a really good one, and that's I think that's that's exactly the kind of laughs and exactly the kind of you know like face smacking. I don't know, buddy, like. But what if this happens? But what if the conditions are different? That's what happens. And those are the laughs that happen in their ski. It's yeah. like, hey, we're trying our best. We think we've come close <laughs> enough to this middle ground. What do you think of this? And they'll be like, this is excellent. But what if this happens? Yeah. You're like, oh, <laughs> yeah, no. I think you just got to find the measure to allocate to that. <laughs> yeah. But then, then there's always something new that you think that would happen. You'd be like, I've never come across this. Sorry. Uh, yes. you, yeah. Sorry, go on. I was gonna say say again something new that I've never come across before. Yeah. 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 Um <sighs> yeah, I guess every so often there's sort of a, a really cool novel idea that a group comes out with that um interski or interthread, um, or even just some of the stuff that's coming out from again, we're we're really member driven and sometimes um stuff that our members come out with is like, ah, oh, I've never thought of that before. I've never thought about wording this this way. Mm. Uh, yoink. And you steal it. And then, it, uh, you know, just like just like Fraser's Watch and Ride, it appears in the Cassie manual, like, next year. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're always pulling those new and novel ideas. And I want to say I've probably gotten more of those, oh, that's really neat ideas from um, Cassie members and Cassie... Uh, other evaluators uh, through discussion, through presentations, through things like evaluator training, getting those like, oh, I'm stealing that. We will move on to the biomechanics and physiology of snowboarding. But in terms of the Cassie reference guide, how involved were you in that and what was your input? So when we did our our major rewrite, um, right after um, Interski in... um, Right after Interski Argentina? When we did our major rewrite a couple years ago, um, <laughs> we um, uh, we were pretty involved in that. So there were there were three of us that were really involved in working together. We were sort of a, a team within the, the tech team to rewrite some of the Cassie quick ride stuff. So one of the things that we were really pushing uh, for and we tried out um, with a couple of instructors in ski schools was to encourage more hands-off teaching and encourage people to learn to side slip 
and learn to do some like uh, gentle direction changes. So a very small drift or like a very tiny pendulum, uh, one footed before strapping on the snowboard and going to two footed. Yeah. Uh, so a really different departure from how we taught traditionally, which was strap both feet in and let me hold your hands. Mm. And so I was really heavily involved in doing that project and doing a nice big rewrite and uh, put put out a lot of both text as well as presentation for the yeah. the uh, the Cassie reference guide and uh, a lot of our quick ride materials and stuff like that. Um, Jeff Chandler, our national uh, technical and education coordinator is um is the the man on the ground who does all the actual you know writing and putting all the the periods and sentences in um with the exception of what we've had for the past couple of years which was the uh, cassie women in snowboarding appendix and so uh that i was actually i wrote that myself wrote and researched that myself and uh collaborated with a um psychologist in new zealand to write that one so wow. that was a solo project that I was really passionate about, and I'm still really passionate about it. Um, and really passionate about, uh, you know, women for education. Oh, um, wow. And it's been nice because this year's uh, manual, which is now a living document, so we're moving towards an online reference guide format, mm -hmm. and we're trying to update that. And instead of keeping the um, women in snowboarding section. Um, on its own, trying to incorporate some of the ideas, some of the paragraphs, some of the writing, and hopefully some of the language to make teaching snowboarding more universal. Yeah. 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 So in terms of reference guide writing, um, yeah, like it's a, a, it's a lot of work and it's a, it's a big project that we're always sort of continually working on, even when we can't update it. But I'm pretty excited at the direction we're going these days with our reference guide, which is trying to turn it into more of a, an online multimedia platform rather than this just giant textbooks you've got to cart around the world <laughs> yeah and can it make it definitely way more inclusive in general as well isn't it yeah, yeah. i think that that's a big one right like snowboarding started as guys teaching other guys mm. and um and that's been fabulous that's been great it's gotten us really far but looking at what's going on with you know women teaching men men teaching women women teaching women yeah. i think that some of the body movements that we uh, take for granted in in people or that guys take for granted in other male shaped bodies that those don't always apply to uh, other shaped bodies um, no. they don't always no. kids they don't always apply to women they don't always apply to you know all of the other people maybe people that don't have those same uh, cultural movement patterns moving on to the biomechanics and physiology of snowboarding First off, I want to know your background, Merlin, in this topic and how is it incorporated in snowboarding overall? Uh, yeah, I definitely I have a bit of a background in biomechanics so that, you know, my, my university degree that uh, turned me into a snowboard instructor was not entirely out of just uh, just snowboarding. I didn't graduate with a, a BSc in snowboarding. I graduated with a um, BSc uh, with honours in biomedical science um, and I was much better at science courses than anything else. So I took a lot of science-based electives um, and did a lot of like uh, physiology, a lot of anatomy that included like labs where I was, you know, working with human cadavers. I was working with animals. Um, I learned a lot that way. And I think I've always just been really interested in making sure that I understand stuff fully. And so if it's movement-based, I've always needed to understand how this moves, how I work, how my skeleton, my my body, my tendons, my muscles work to create something. So both with my background in in um in biomedical science as well as my my snowboarding, I've always been thinking along that lines. Um I'm also a practicing um uh sports massage therapist um that I try and do between seasons. It's been doing a lot more of it during the lockdown, but um <laughs> Uh, cause with no snow, but again, you know, as I'm, I'm working away, I'm always thinking about how this relates to how the bodies I'm working with relate to, to snowboarding, you know? Mm. Um, and so that's my background and that's always been something that's I've carried with me and carried through into, into my teaching. Um, so a lot of the stuff that I care a lot about in terms of the reference guide is that 
physics and biomechanics and snowboarding. Um, I guess one of the things that's a really neat update that I was really proud to get into all of our casting materials was um, changing the way we think about um, standing on a snowboard. So for years, we have talked about a um, relaxed position on the snowboard. Yeah. And um, that doesn't really accurately describe how we want to stand on a snowboard. So um, we updated our language uh, a couple of years ago based on some of the recommendations that I was making to talk a lot more about an athletic or a ready position. Okay. Yeah. 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 Which yeah. is so much more, you know, that's, that's carried through other sports and it's time for us to make sure that we're sort of updating ourselves to that. But this idea of being, um, being in a place where you're at an equal amount of tension in your muscles. So being yeah. in a place where all of your joints can both close and open an equal amount. So then you can respond effectively towards that. Exactly, right? And and having that like respond effectively is really important in terms of being able to have all of your key joints of snowboarding yeah. move together. Um, and, and move together in such a way that they can create the kind of movement patterns that you want to create, um, or avoid the kind of movement patterns you don't want to create, like a face plant into a tree well. <laughs> um, and I think one of the things that was a really good one that I'd like to see a little bit more of incorporated is this idea that the key joints of, of snowboarding, we talk a lot about like muscles and the way we move. But a lot of the muscles that we use to snowboard with cross many of our key joints. A lot of the muscles that move our, our upper leg cross both our hip and our knee. A lot of the muscles that move our ankles cross our knee and then anchor down into our foot and into our toes. So thinking about snowboarding, we talk a lot about when we're teaching, we talk a lot about move this joint, move that joint. And I think what would be great is if we started to take a step back and we started to think about the fact that joints move in unison and in harmony mm -hmm. and they need to be in that ready and long position or, you know, able to close and open because the position you're holding, maybe a hip can have a big impact on how much you can actually move your knee. Yeah. Where your knees are sitting has a great big impact on how much you're, how little can, you can move your ankles. Oh. So stopping thinking about snowboarding as bend, the, bend your knees, bend your knees, and starting to think about, hey, you know, your movement pattern should be more ankles and knees rather than knee and hip. Mm. Okay. Yeah. That makes yeah, sense. Yeah. That, no, that, that does make sense massively. Yeah. That's Hopefully that resonates with you. I, I'm looking, yeah. I'm like, to like have some faces to look at and I'm looking at you guys nodding along with yeah. me and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it, it definitely, it, it. It definitely makes sense, and um, it, you know, I think Laura introduced me to this, and I did say on a pro kind of previous podcast um, about with, with especially with um, my arm, especially on the toe side, she was seeing my shoulder was coming ready for, and she was like, "Okay, if you open up essentially your palm and kind of bring it forward, it's going to re help realign that." And it, yeah, and it was such a it was such a, a massive kind of mind blow to me, and how everything kind of relates. Um, yeah, and it's super cool in that way. I'd say even even to your stance. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, even to your stance as well. Um, I was uh, last season was trying to figure out um stance at, um my stance with, and I had this habit where um uh my shoulder dropped a bit. So I was like, okay, I, I know I need to tighten my core, straighten my back up a little bit to fix all that, and just keep doing runs to get that correct position. But then I was like, oh, what if I just you know move my stance slightly inwards fixed it to how long my toe side and i was like ah that makes sense yeah right it's yeah. those little those little like easy things that are those easy corrections right the the simple correction of like hey first the the easiest thing you can do is just change the equipment around a little bit you know back to you know me getting pulled out of a pair of bindings because the bindings didn't fit on my first experience couldn't snowboard and needed something that fit you know quick little corrections like that so if, you know, as an instructor, if you can quickly assess how your student might move or how your student might stand and then take a look down at their equipment, if you can hand them that tool, take them into the rental shop, or you're certified to be able to make those changes, 
man, those changes can be like you say, instant game changers. Yeah. Being able to assess your your students how they're standing and is their equipment set up well for them? You know, we we spend all this time making sure our desks are set up correctly so we don't get all sorts of, you know, neck problems. Every time you get into a car, you're going to adjust the seat accordingly to you. Why do we hand snowboarders snowboards off with generic setups and no one ever changes those around? Mm. I think it's more just hassle. <laughs> Especially when someone always moves your seat forward, you got to roll that back every single yeah. time. <laughs> just, just hassle because I'll, you'll have um, ski high and stuff. We'll just, you know, you have your basic setup, and especially with sort of the Burton boards, the rental boards, your rental equipment, that's just having a hundred or like, well, 10 people trying to change their bindings, and especially if they're a beginner snowboarding, that must be tricky. It's hugely tricky. And so that's where the, the role of the instructor being able to get certified on those LTR yeah. boards to be able to make those changes. Um, maybe later, you know, maybe as a beginner, it doesn't make such a difference. But as an instructor, being able to assess your students' equipment, be knowledgeable about those changes so that you can make those changes maybe for your intermediate riders. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, as a beginner, you just need something that kind of fits and goes like left and right a little bit, yeah. you know? helps you out a little bit right so um and then you need a really good instructor to make sure that you're doing all the right movement patterns but you could learn to snowboard on a lunch tray as long as the bindings can do up yeah but, but it's later that you know an instructor's role can really come into making sure that a board is properly suited to their student that a setup is properly suited to the student so that they can achieve a, a ready position that is effective yeah. you know forward lean can make a huge difference too much too little can really affect the ankle and the knee joint yeah the um same with the ankle strap or even toe strap yeah put the ankle strap a little bit higher towards your shin then it becomes it's a lot stiff and you won't have as much joint or ankle joint flex as you ride and that depends on how you want it um personally i quite like my flex and my joints and having softer F um, flexing the bindings of the boot but my mate Rich has was like he quite likes his stiff binding boots and bindings to ride and he quite likes that stiff play um, uh, to actually get his riding to what he wants yeah and I love that I love that we all have those different opinions on how we want to move and how we want to solve the puzzle of making sure that we're in a position that is allowing us to move the best way. I'm like you, I like to feel everything. I like to have that softer movement and that softer support, but by no means when someone asks me for a recommendation about what they should ride, I'll be like, cool, what's your riding style? How do you like, do you like a stiff boot? Do you like a soft boot? Have you thought about moving your ankle strap down? These are the pros and cons of things. And I think that that's what is really important to understand with, um, with biomechanics of, of humans is that there are so many different ways of getting the, you know, little subtle variations in getting to a place where you can be as effective as possible. Mm. Uh, we see that in sports at the highest level, all those little marginal gains, uh, you know, this this person prefers this this person prefers this these you know there's different options i think that that's really important to understand in snowboarding as well is that you know there are many different ways within the the framework of we all mostly have an ankle a knee and a hip but how to get you know the right movement pattern to happen so you can get the right the right performance you know board to snow is there anything you're researching now for the future and currently any ideas you want to implement in Cassie itself to do with biomechanics? I think um, our, our physics and biomechanics section um, is something that's on the uh, to-do list for mm. the tech in the next couple of years. Um, we've approached it in the past from a very anatomical perspective. And I think that, well, I definitely know that um, it's, it's less about the anatom anatomical perspective and it's more along the lines of um, movement based. So like a, a kinesthetic um, and, and relating to, you know, the movements that we want to have happen. So I think that that's one of the, the ways um, our physics and biomechanics workshops reflect that um, that a lot better. So if you've done a CASI course in the past couple of years and you've done the physics and biomechanics workshop, it's really effective. 
Um, and I think that just rewriting the, the physics and biomechanics section to be more applicable to the, the competencies and the five skills of snowboarding would give us something that really ties us all in uh, together and becomes a much more usable resource for for instructors so that we can read stuff that has everyone nodding along and excited to share their stories about soft boots and stiff boots and binding movements and and you know the the teaching relationship of um of moving around biomechanics in terms of like arms and shoulders and and head position and how those can affect riding so i think turning that into a more functional resource means that we don't feel instructors don't feel like they're just discovering the stuff on their own they feel like that is a resource that they can learn from. Talking about CASI, can you give us some information on how the CASI levels and system works and what do they consist of? Yeah, most definitely. Um, and there's a document on the CASI website that's um, new for this year that is a really nice little flow chart that clearly outlines um, where all of the pieces of CASI fit together. So we've got our core um, our core certification levels, we've got four levels of certification. Level one is an entry level um, instructor, um, and you're certified to teach uh, beginners. Level two um, is, um, is our next level of instruction, and that is uh, making sure that you can refine the teaching skills to the beginners and higher level beginners, as well as teach intermediate riders um, and display intermediate and, uh, and advanced riding skills in a couple of different areas. So not just on groomed terrain, but also some very basic freestyle maneuvers, the ability to carve and the ability to ride on some off-piece terrain. Uh, level three is our, is our next level. Um, to be able to take the level three now, um, a prerequisite is the level two, as well as the Cassie level one freestyle course. Yeah. Yeah. So the CASI Level 1 Freestyle Course is an entry-level uh, freestyle course. It's designed with uh, safety and the basic instruction of uh, basic maneuvers over uh, really small features um, in mind. So it's it's great. It follows on and takes a lot of cues from the CASI Level 1. So it's got a lot more like uh, lessons that people can just take whole cloth, make their own, and teach back on to, uh, onto the slopes. So hopefully it'll make terrain parks safer for everybody if we've got more CASI instructors that have that park level one. You can take the park level one at any point in time, whether or not you're a CASI one instructor, a CASI two instructor, or you're three and uh, you haven't had that experience before. So that's one, two, the freestyle one. And then the next on the, the pathway is the uh, CASI level three. CASI three evalu um, instructor uh, certification involves uh, advanced um, riding and advanced teaching. So we're starting to look at the ability to um, improve the riding of really strong riders, uh, display excellence in your own snowboarding, displaying board performance in your own riding, as well as a really good technical demonstrations for students of all levels. Yeah. This includes on-piste, off-piste, and park. Oh, great. And then kind of those modules as well alongside that um because i sorry just kind of backtrack but is we um in terms of the freestyle because that's quite a new thing i know that was um you've had it for a while but you had a, le a level two freestyle as well which is coming back which we'll of course talk about in in the next kind of like question anyway um sorry yeah. carry on <laughs> Yeah, um, the level one freestyle, we completely rewrote that for last year. And um, it's a much more accessible course. Um, it's really designed to make sure that people can, um, can teach um, good quality freestyle lessons. Yeah. So the, the um, writing standard is um, really nice, consolidated, basic freestyle maneuvers, so 180s both ways over small jumps, um, air straight airs with variations over very small jumps, uh, um, small boxes with a small degree of variation in those as well, mm. and, and being able to do some, some butter or flatland tricks uh, with some variation. But um, by no means are we looking for a McMorris brother to come out to the course no. and throw down a couple of Cork fives, it's very much, do you have the standard tricks to be able to go out and teach a, 
a basic freestyle lesson. The same way is that you'd expect your instructor to be able to turn left and right uh, well <laughs> on demand. <Yeah. laughs> uh, you should be able to have your instructor come out and throw down a 50-50 for a box or mm -hmm. a, a clean 180 as, as needed. So... Mm -hmm. Is that the criteria? So you have your sort of freestyle that's coming up on the level two. Is there no sort of criteria for the normal, the nor in the level two for um, freestyle? So itself for the freestyle, new yeah. this yeah. year is a mandatory maneuver, and that mandatory maneuver is an ollie off a of flat base. Oh, sweet, cool. And then I'm probably, yeah. I'm pretty sure you guys will just experiment with your courses. Will go, oh, there, you can do an ollie. Let's try an ollie. See how. See how you figure that Pretty out. Much. Yeah. And it's always been, it's it's for uh, about six years, we've had Ollie's just as a, like a teachable topic in the level two. Yeah. Um, but a little bit of a wording change this year has meant that now, you know, you probably should have to be able to do an Ollie on a flat yeah. base while moving a little bit for yeah. your level two. Yeah. So, because honestly, a level two's instructor is probably going to get asked to teach Ollie's at some point in time by the people yeah. that they're teaching. Right. That or 50-50 yeah. on a box, which is, you know, your bog standard stuff. Um, yeah, exactly. But exactly. I'm pretty sure it's not that, you know, difficult to do a 50-50 or teach them. I mean, it's probably not on the criteria, but do you just teach it um, on your course anyway? You'll be like, it's not on the criteria 50-50. But... On the level two, we don't have enough time to, oh. we don't even have enough time to go in the park. Um, and so it's a, it's a busy four days that level, that level two is, it's a very busy four days. Um, man, so that we do, we do not have time to go to words, even look at a box. It's like not the time that you would like set up and go over the box and get off of it. Maybe too even much. look both ways that yeah. too much, no, no time for that. You're going to need to put some practice teachers in there or work wow. on, work on what you're learning. So, um, so yeah, in the level two, we don't go into the park. We're our only freestyle is um, is finding stuff outside the park. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. The level one, the level one freestyle um, is really good because it's also got a huge component of safety, and so it educates instructors to then educate their students on how to use terrain parks safely and effectively to be good members of society in train parks and call your drops and don't jump on someone else's head. Don't yeah. snake anybody. Right. So Spending. the idea behind the level one is to actually spend the time on the level one freestyle, uh, on learning terrain park etiquette and then teaching terrain park etiquette. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that is, a, that's a big thing in general to, you know, learn and get behind because yeah. even as just instructors, especially, um, you don't get, really taught that much until you decide to either get told it by someone or unless you're a park rat or try and go off and learn yourself because you you just don't know um which is what i had to do i had to go and find a you know just a bug standard youtube video learn snowboard addiction learn the uh requirements and sort of your etiquette behind there and it makes you the world a good place when you go behind those rules so yeah yeah no, and that's it. So learning the rules so that you feel comfortable in the park, learning the rules so that other people are comfortable having you in the park is, is amazing. Yeah. And then um, and then what's nice is that for for the, all the, the learners who aren't great at looking in videos, the, all those who need maybe to feel it to learn, all those who need to to have it explained to them in a way that they're going to understand or using prior knowledge that can't learn from videos, then that's where the Cassie one, that's where taking a, um, a lesson with a Cassie one freestyle certified instructor, that's going to be so much more valuable to the subset of population that may not learn that well off of YouTube. And so hopefully we'll have more people that are Cassie one freestyle certified. Um, and that more people realize that there's value in it. And like our bend as Cassie evaluators has been to keep people safe when they are beginners, let's keep people safe as they're beginners in the park too, not just out on the slopes making their turns for the first time. Right. So hopefully that can help out, you know, not just as a as a pathway to certification, but there's also real value in getting that Cassie one freestyle. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And kind of uh, going from back to the um, the level four itself, just having a quick um, discussion about the the criteria and the level four. Um, what's needed in terms of the teaching standard, the writing standards. Um, yeah, and then kind of moving on in terms of 
um, the ISI and, and whatnot. Right. So um, the CASI, just to recap the CASI 3, uh, the standards for it. So um, in one and two, as well as in Freestyle one, we've had two components and we still continue to have two components. There's a writing and a teaching component. And you can pass either part and then go back for a retest for the other one. If you like me, you don't pass everything in the first go. Um, and you go back and retest it. Yeah. Um, so in level three, we add in an additional, um, an additional um, component. So you've got your writing, you've got your teaching, but you've also got this additional piece that's called pedagogy. Um, pedagogy is just a fancy word for instructor training. Yeah. It's used around the world. Cassie didn't invent it. Um, and, uh, but it's just a, it's the art and skill of teaching teachers to teach. Mm. So um, and because the level three also becomes, once you're successful at passing level three, then you're, Avail you, you're able to come to evaluator training and enter into the rookie process to become a CASI evaluator. Okay. So we um, don't wait until you have achieved the highest level of certification to start training other instructors. Yeah. We run a lot of courses. There's a lot of, a lot of kids like me that start teaching at 16 years old, and there's a lot of courses that need to happen to put snowboard instructors out on mountains all over the place. Um, so we have a huge drive and a huge uptake in terms of CASI courses, uh, being taken for people for all sorts of reasons, ride improvement, teach their kids, not as well as work for ski schools. So we need evaluators. We need evaluators. <laughs> <laughs> we start the evaluator training process with that pedagogy in level three. Okay. The level four incorporates that to a higher level. So the level four has uh, four components to it. It has two writing components. Um, that deal with uh, both um, an overall picture of writing as well as a set of mandatory uh, maneuvers. Mm. We have a teaching component to it. Um, and then there's also a high-end uh, pedagogy component to it. Um, and that pedagogy looks a little bit less like um, training uh, basic evaluators and looks a little bit more like uh, being a ski school trainer. So what a morning session would look like on your funnest of morning sessions you've ever had. You take, a, take the ski school out for an hour, you teach them a little something about snowboarding, you make them feel awesome, and you throw in a little tip or trick about teaching for the day that'll hopefully make those lessons better and make sure that no one's doing what I did at 16 and teach people to turn in 90 minutes. So little, yeah. little, little teaching tidbits along with an hour of rider development. Um, and that's the pedagogy at the level four. Ah. So well, for the IS... IA, um, I'm getting told that you have to, you do your level three, and then you could you go to your level four without an ISISA stamp, or because there's yeah. that, that extra little jump if you want to do the ISIA. You, what are the requirements to do add on to that to get your ISIA stamp? Um, so say you've just done your level three and you want to get that ISIA. Right. So the ISIA um, certification, we our CASI members are able. We're recognized by the ISA as an official uh, certifying body for snowboard instructors. ISA has an additional amount of hours that you need to show you have done study. So it usually involves taking a couple other courses as well. Some of the evaluator training can um, help to make up those hours. Um, but usually um, because our, our system doesn't involve month-long or year-long courses, there usually has to be some additional study that's undertaken by CASI members. The other thing that we don't have as part of our certification at all in CASI is we don't have any avalanche awareness or avalanche training. Okay. No, none at all. Um, we leave that up to the Canadian Avalanche Association. The oh, Canadian okay. Avalanche Association takes care of all of our avalanche stuff. <laughs> half of our country, and I'm going to generalize and a bunch of Canadians are going to get mad about this, but half of our country is not avalanche prone at all. It's either too flat or it's too icy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To defend everyone. Um, and then the other half of our country is ridiculously avalanche prone, <laughs> like really, really, really scary. So um, the Canadian Avalanche Association, um, you know, takes care of the, the highest level of avalanche forecasting and education in our country. We are a country that deals with a lot of really 
a crushingly unfortunate avalanche um, deaths and situations. Um, for example, Craig Kelly was killed in an avalanche. Someone who had more avalanche and backcountry experience than just about anyone worked at the highest levels of Canadian Avalanche Association when he was guiding and something happened and him and his entire party were killed just mm -hmm. down the road from here. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so there's some, there's some pretty, you know, our uh, prime minister's brother was killed in, uh, in an avalanche. Um, so, you know, we take avalanche training very seriously in Canada and as Cassie, we leave the avalanche certification up to the Canadian avalanche association because they're the experts. Why not go get trained by the experts? <laughs> so Cassie members that want to get certified need to go to the Canadian avalanche certification and get their avalanche levels. And that helps towards their training as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, so basically we become part of the certification process for people looking for their ISA stamps, but we don't become the sole uh, piece of certification that Canadians or Canadian trained instructors would need to get their ISA stamp. Okay, that yeah. makes sense. And kind of um, going from the, the, the main kind of route and, and those little modules, um, kind of diverging in terms of like, um, I'm guessing the adaptive and um, whatnot, that's its own separate organization itself, um, or is that yeah. part of um, Cassie in some way and CSI in some cases? Yeah, we work really closely with, um, we call it CADS, the Canadian Association of uh, Disabled, Disabled Ski and Snowboard Instructors, but CADS is their uh, organization. We freely work with them really closely, uh, happily give them our materials to continue their education processes. We have uh, many of our members are dual certified with um, CADS as well as Cassie, and um, and we have some reciprocal arrangements back and forth. So we know those guys. Most of those guys are all well, on the snowboard side of things. Are all Cassie folk anyway. Um, so we have a really close relationship with those guys. That's so cool. Yeah, because I did when um, when kind of going to Big White, you see the the cool volunteers as well with like the Pounder Hounds um, jackets on them, and like that. I find that so cool. Like, it's such a cool name for 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 them. Um, yeah, and kind of actually moving on to Big White itself, um, I do want to kind of talk about that being um, essentially where you're kind of based off out of now. Um, yeah. When was the first time of kind of going to Big White and, and um, kind of teaching there and, and evidently training there as well? Yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Um, I When I moved back from the US, I moved to Silver Star, which is just uh, 90 minutes down the road, um, maybe two hours if the conditions are kind of bad. Um, and that was my home for a long time. Um, it would have been my home before uh, I moved to the U.S. And then it was great to, to move back. Uh, Silver Star is awesome, but it's a little bit quieter. The ski school is a little bit smaller. And it doesn't have, at the time, it didn't have any gap programs at all. And now it just has sort of, sort of a small training program, but no real instructor training programs at all. So even my first year back at, at Silver Star, um, which was 2008-2009, uh, um, I was driving over to Big White to run, um, run Cassie courses. So I ran level ones, I ran level twos over here. Um, and I would be here oh, a couple times a season. I would see all of the Big White crew. They were my Big White brothers and sister at evaluated training every year. We'd keep each other safe on the drives home uh, from Banff for Whistler. And so I really felt like there was a lot of camaraderie between Silver Star and uh, Big White. Um, mm -hmm. At the time as well, the both resorts were owned by the same the same ownership. And so my staff pass was good at both places. So hey. when Silver Star closed in the springtime, I would come over here and ride Big White Park for like two weeks until it shut down. <laughs> That's so good. So good. Um, and and that, that Cassie uh, course load continued here until my last year. At Silver Star, I lived in a hotel room um, in Big White. Like I ran 16 Cassie courses here or something like that. It was just, wow. it was a massive load. I was here for seven weeks of what essentially is a 20 week season, right? So it was just nuts. I had worked with the ski school director um, uh, years ago when we were both in Banff, Sunshine Village. And, um, and he's just like, why don't you come work for me? And I'm like, you know what? Let's talk about this. He's like, really? I'm like, yeah, let's, let's, let's talk about this. And, uh, that's, you know, um, that's kind of how I ended up moving here. Um, I bought a house, yeah, my house, uh, 
<laughs> and uh, <laughs> and it's it's great. It's um it's fabulous. It's really where I want to be. Um, the snow here is like no other snow on earth. Um, it's it's light. It's fluffy. You pick it up and you just blow it away in your hand. Um, the uniqueness of Big White as this big sort of spiky mountain that sticks out of relatively rolling terrain that was all um, crushed by glaciers um, means that it attracts more snow and it creates its own snow more often. That fog that we like to complain about is really just tomorrow's snow forming today. Yeah. And so it's it's amazing. Like the snow is dry, the slopes are great, the trees are incredible here. Um, so I am really, really happy to be home. And with Big White opening about two weeks ago, I am thrilled to be home. It's so good. The snow here is amazing. And kind of what's your um, quick question, your favorite run in Big White? Do you have one at all? Uh, the one I just did or the one I'm going to next? Oh, no, your, your, your favorite run in, in Big White. What's your favorite kind of run? Um, my favorite run or my favorite kind of run? If it's my favorite run, my favorite one is the one I just did or the one I'm going to next. <laughs> oh, yeah, true. true yeah, that makes sense. Sorry, it just, it just clicked in my head, Melons. I'm very sorry. <laughs> <laughs> because any, any mountain always has changing conditions. Yeah. Um, it has different conditions and different times of year. Mm. And so your favorites always kind of change. Um, mm. I'm sure there's a different side of the snow dome that's better to ride down in the morning than in the afternoon. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. 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 Maybe. <laughs> and, and, you know, the bigger the resort, the bigger the hill, the bigger anything, it changes depending on, you know, is it December or is it April? You know, the, the bumps on dragon's tongue get big and foamy and wonderful by, by uh, you know, midwinter and are, are fabulous. Um, but springtime, go up higher and find the find the moguls on playground, and they're going to be that much more agreeable. Mm. Um, you know, park in April is the place to be. It's warm, and all your friends are riding there. But you know, middle of January, I want to be hiding in the trees down Narnia. Yeah, <laughs> That's so good. Yeah. And kind of um, staying in Big White, it's quite home to quite a lot of like level three and four kind of training itself. Um, yeah, kind of talking about why has that kind of been made that kind of specific hub because because there's quite there's a lot more of a higher number in terms of level three and four instructors i see in big white than kind of in other resorts in canada yeah at one time we were the only resort in canada that had two level four evaluators on staff Um, we were really proud to have one of the highest numbers of level three um instructors in any ski resort um in any ski resort in the West. Um, And um, I think there was a culture here of um, a lot of instructor, instructor training programs, which meant great work for, um, for a lot of higher certified staff. There was a great history of uh, leadership in the ski school that allowed us to, uh, to keep pursuing our, our Cassie courses and our Cassie education, um, both in resort as well as outside of resort. Um, I just think this, the big white, you know, had a long history of a lot of really well certified instructors and, um, and yeah, it's, you know, the mountains actually a really good learning mountain. Um, I think just a lot of people fall in love with this place and, and love it like I do and want to stay and want to be here. It's uh, it's a great place. So last question for this segment, the future of Cassie. What are the goals and where would you like to see Cassie heading? Oh, um, I think our biggest thing is like continuing our development of um, one of the new things that is um, not secret as of just a couple of weeks ago, but uh, probably a little bit new to some of your listeners is this idea of in- introducing some mandatory maneuvers at level one and level two. So, um, you know, we're looking at not only evaluating an overall picture of snowboarding, but starting the process of building um, instructors that are used to having to do things on demand right away, uh, even from the level one and level two. It's pretty, pretty simple at those lower levels, like um, 
level one, you just have to be able to do uh, beginner turns uh, forward and switch and hold a carve traverse across the slope. Yeah. Ooh. As well as to be able to do some, you know, good turns down things. But um, those, those kind of mandatory maneuvers are brand new and uh, were our sort of big top secret that we were talking a lot about over last season. Um, and hopefully it, it helps to uh, set people up much better for moving up through the levels. So one of the, the tasks that is the most difficult or most poorly done on the level four is intermediate sliding turns on a black slope, regular and switch. Okay, yeah. But if we start doing sliding turns at a really low level in level one, when you're marked and someone's standing there looking at you, well, no, not standing there looking at you, but um, when you're asked to do these things, forward and switch, beginner turns, and then in level two, novice turns, beginner and switch, and then in level three, on a blue slope, intermediate, regular and switch, by the time it gets to the level four, hopefully we'll see better performance out of our, our instructors and get more people passing because that's what we really want. We mm -hmm. want more CASI, uh, CASI instructors. We want more CASI evaluators. We want more trainers. So, um, yeah, so that's that's probably the, the you know, really uh, not even cutting edge. Let's say it's so new, so fresh, it's bleeding edge <laughs> of CASI as we're, we're starting to move forward. And uh, yeah, if that, that helps you out. And I think that's what we want to do is stay, stay sharp, keep adapting our, our, um, our teaching systems and our snowboarding systems to match what's going on with, um, with what's going on in snowboarding. We never want to get stale. So yeah, going into the next section about the Cassie riding style, can you talk about how Cassie focus on using the lower body to rotate and not so much on the foot pedaling itself? Can you also as well, Melon, explain the reason behind that and how it came to be? Yeah, um, the way I've been explaining this for years, and I'm going to preface this with this is my own personal explanation, but it, it always seems to resonate with people. And it comes from my experience teaching um, all over the world in multiple snow conditions and in multiple systems, is that um, we deal with pretty decent snow half of the time like really good snow. And then the other half of the time is um, sheet ice and the downhill skating rink here. And so either you can't see your feet or your board's just sliding all over the place. Like we don't have, um, we don't always have perfect slopes. And so we, the interface of the board and the snow is not always an ideal picture. If the snow is up to your knees, you cannot see your feet to pedal. Mm. And you really can't see your students' feet to see if they're pedaling. <laughs> Yeah. If your board's sliding because it's so slick and so icy and like there's no grip, pedaling isn't going to help you at all. Um, your board's just drifting down a, maybe in a mid afternoon or after school icy slope somewhere. Uh, pedaling's not going to not going to give you what you want. So for our snow, for our snow conditions, uh, adding lower body rotary movements, um, you, like starting from the knee, which is a big joint that's easy to see that's easy for our students to understand that um, that's, I would say the the reason and the drive behind why we've chosen to use rotary movements and turning with the lower body as our initial, rather than looking at pedaling movements. It's just under yeah. our snow condition. You know, what's going to work for, what's going to work for Canadian snow more often? Not pedaling. Yeah. Is pedaling amazing? Yeah. It's awesome. Um, but not all the time and not in every Canadian condition. Great. Yeah. And yeah, and yeah, kind of, no, that makes sense. And kind of me, I mean, yeah, moving from that and um, going from New Zealand, I'm guessing you see they do a bit more foot pedaling. Is that the case? Um, yeah. And, and kind of talking about, um, do they, they bring that in quite sooner, don't they? Um, in, in, in their kind of systems. Yeah, uh, they definitely do. And, you know, they've, they've got ice, no, I'm not going to lie that one. And they've got good slushy snow. Um, it's um, for them, it, it works for them. They're, they're unlikely to have knee deep snow where you can't see if your students are moving their feet or not. Um, mm -hmm. At least on their beginner slopes, their beginner slopes are, they have a little bit more grooming on a regular basis. Um, it is not uncommon. I have definitely rocked up to the beginner slope teaching uh, both at Big White and at Silver Star 
and gone, huh, there really is boot deep snow. <laughs> so sort of the last thing that gets groomed and sometimes it's forgotten. Whereas there's a great push in beginner slopes in New Zealand to make sure that those are safe and manicured and fabulous for teaching beginners. Um, we don't always have that. So um, I think that that's, that would be a big difference. Um, also, historically, that's just what's worked for them, and they've carried that through. Historically, we've always talked about turning with the lower body, and we are hanging on to that. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it does work different. In, yeah, it does work in different ways, because doing my level two course in Aronson, um, Bailey, it was very like pedaling with your feet and that centric. Um, and that's how they took teach it and it does work for a lot of people and how it does but learning stuff from saying um your your area which is through max he was to use knees a bit more it does help and i can see why you do it to get say a grippier turn in a on a steeper slope and how to get that toe to heel turn round easier and make it more fluent um than just doing simple foot pedaling um, which in my personal opinion in my personal experience it's helped massively learning to do stuff a bit more with your knees and not just being as they say like a basic robot and just doing everything with the feet and nothing else with your shoulders or, well nothing else with your hips or your knees yeah. Uh, yeah and I think that you know we revisit this idea that you know you've got to you got to pick something and why can't we have a middle ground you know we either look towards like foot pedaling and board snow interface or you look towards you know prime movers of the body one end or the other and the ideal would be right in the middle the ideal would be to have both of those right pedaling and grip is amazing knee steering and rotary movements are amazing but combining those both in a beginner lesson it's going to be really challenging for the beginner it's just going to confuse them yeah i think that does not work you either just <laughs> <laughs> keep it simple choose one and then learn the other one later and if they go oh that's better then you know it works yeah. better yeah um i've also got another question with how you guys teach in canada um so up in the alps is very sort of microclimate very summery i know in canada you have just dumps and dumps of like snow going to like minus 40 um that's my <laughs> Basically, a winter wonderland uh, makes me all jealous all the time every time I see them um, posts raging from there. Um, how do you sort of teach your sort of clients in that end or your customers in that end? Um, let's say you are doing a lesson where it is, you know, very cold and that lot. How you obviously don't want to be talking too long out on the mountain. You want to kind of just get them to do the ridings. How would you sort of go into that sort of style of teaching? How would you do? That. Well, I think there's a lot of different ways like Canada is a pretty big country and we have some pretty diverse areas so there yeah. are places that are really close to major centers that uh, teach what's called uh, station teaching so they'll see anywhere from three to five thousand beginners often school kids in a day to teach <laughs> yeah and it's they build specific learning slopes where there's an instructor or a group of instructors that are dotted all the way along these slopes or these areas and so people will walk out of a rental shop there's one there's one area in particular that doesn't actually have lesson times it just has instructors standing at these stations all day long people pick up their equipment they walk out of the the rental shop they walk towards their instructor first station instructor and they get taught the basics and then once they've graduated from the basics and once they've got it they get moved on to the next okay. station so on and so forth all the way across um, so in a way that would stop them from getting particularly cold because they're always yeah. moving forward in their, in their lesson progression. Places like, um, like the Prairie provinces, which have, um, unbelievably cold weather. So this is where like the McMorris brothers are from. These are, um, short hills into usually down riverbeds or ravines, and it gets into the minus forties and minus fifties. Um, hardiest people I've ever run into they're they're dressed for the weather um but the nice part is that you're never more than like about 100 meters away from a uh um an indoor space to go and warm up so you know you I've walked past the kids groups and the kids areas in there and they just have massive facilities so they can bring children in and pump them full of hot chocolate and warm up their little hands and toes and then take them back out again so 
um, shorter lessons or lessons that are structured around multiple breaks is, is a way to get by that. Um, and in the West, where we don't have that luxury is, uh, again, like you say, making sure that you're being concise with your words, that you're monitoring your students for safety hazards. And that's not just, you know, what's going on with the slopes. That's also how they're feeling. Are they cold? Are they tired? Are they shutting off? Are they able to continue to perform? And that's a big part of the CASI's training system is to create awareness in our instructors about potential barriers to learning. Yeah. yeah, and we mark that on our in our lessons as well. We don't just mark on the technical content. We also mark on, are you keeping your lesson moving enough? <laughs> <laughs> because like you said, Canada is pretty cold and we've got to keep <laughs> people going. <laughs> it's not enough that it's technically correct. You need to not phrase your fingers off too. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I kind of want to go on one more tangent. Um, just to briefly talk about um, the Rookie Academy in, in New Zealand um, and how that kind of came around and your experience with that, essentially. Right. Um, yeah. I I met some of the guys from the Rookie Academy in uh, at Interski in Argentina, and they're really passionate and really interested. I ran a session about um, women in snow sports. So that was one of our two presentations. Um on the books in Argentina, and I had a lot of people show up to my session. So can you elaborate that a bit further with the uh, women in snow sports? Yeah, definitely. Um, so basically, we just took a look at, I took a look at, um, I wanted to know why as women, and as women who move like women, because not all girls are, are built the same way, and not all girls have the same problems, but some of us do. And um, started to look at what was going on with why the dropout rate was high, why the injury rate was high, and what kind of other research had gone into looking at the way that women move, the way that women are built, and uh, the way that we approach snowboarding from a, a psychosocial standpoint. And to see if there were any differences between men and women, and to see if there were, were some of the differences that I was seeing in less women at the top level, less women continuing in snowboarding, less women or women moving in ways that I had always seen us move and fail <laughs> and, and stories like that. So I, I looked at this from a perspective of, um, I started with anatomy and that didn't tell the whole story. And so then I started looking at like movement patterns and basing a lot of what I ended up writing off of injury patterns in other sports like basketball um, basketball, skiing, and um, uh, women's soccer. And looking at the differences in movement patterns and performance in high-end athletes as well as recreational athletes in those three sports. And then using that with my knowledge of snowboarding to carry it forward into some recommendations for instructors on how if your female student stands like this, this is why, and here's a correction that you can make an easy, easy change. If your female snowboarder moves like this in such a way, here's a way you can help her to move better. And this is why she's moving that way okay. in a couple different situations. And if your female snowboarder is acting like this, here's, here's a research-based idea of why, and here's how to help her out and get her to feel uh, the same sort of stoke that maybe your male snowboarders are feeling. So based around education and understanding for, for women in snow sports, geared not just towards women teaching women, but geared towards everyone teaching women or everyone yeah. teaching women who ha have these common presentations of female specific movement patterns. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. that, that's what the women in snowboarding section was all about yeah reading that page in the cassie manual has helped me massively in teaching women how to snowboard because it gave me a better understanding on how their body works in general which is you know fucking awesome oh uh, that's awesome yeah and that sort of leads me into my next topic is the fact that it seems like cassie have a lot more women riders um, you know, signing and being a part of their association than other asso instructor associations. Um, what sort of the reason why 
that's the case between that. I hope so. Yeah. I really hope so. Like some of the original articles I wrote about women and snowboarding, I found in one of the original articles I found actually reprinted in the uh, Australian reference guide. Um, mm-hmm. All the same diagrams and words and everything like that. I was like, well, at least you're doing something. Um, I think that, I think that we're, we're doing okay. We've got really good numbers in our Cassie one. We've got good numbers in our Cassie two. We don't have good numbers still. We still have work to do in the Cassie three and especially on the level four level. We, there's only seven women certified at the Cassie level four ever. Three of those women were grandfathered. Okay. Um, and a lot of those, you know, not, not a lot of them are still involved. So, um, yeah, we're we're still not there yet. We're we're doing good, but I think all of our associations need to work together to keep yeah. keep fighting that fight. Let's keep going, girls. Let's keep going, boys who support girls. <laughs> you know, I think that's that's a really big thing to recognize. So thanks for noticing that. Um, the fight's not over, but um, we can do it together. So good. Um, yeah, and um, kind of just moving um, onto the rookie academy very very quickly. I know we just kind of really sorry. Started. That's all good. It's good to hear from that. Um, yeah. So glad you read that section. That's fabulous. <laughs> and yeah, kind of moving from um, the experiences in the rookie academy. Oh yeah, so um, a bunch of stuff came together to just um, just make that happen. Um, knowing people in rookie academy, knowing. Uh, some of the snowboarders on that side, knowing um, and being connected to the uh, Dean Gareth, who run Rookie Academy and have for the longest time. Um, you know, Cassie's um, involvement in many other countries. Um, and it was just one of those things where getting getting a reciprocal agreement signed between the NZSIA and Cassie to be able to run certain Cassie courses on New Zealand soil was uh, really just, a f- it was a big project, but I was really proud to be able to have the right people to bring that all together to make that happen. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, it was, it was great. Um, we ran our first uh, level three exam and our first level two on New Zealand soil last summer. And we were on track before everything um to run more courses this year uh we're going to run uh both a cassie level three course as well as a cassie three exam so not just the exam and then we're going to run a couple of level twos and uh looking at some um potential for some level one freestyles as well and that hopefully will translate into some future cassie courses running in new zealand and continuing to run in future years when um yeah when we can so um, yeah, yeah and- really looking forward to that. It was it was great terrain for it. Um, Treble Cone in New Zealand is some of the most incredible terrain I've ever seen in the Southern Hemisphere. It was uh, Canada like, <laughs> shall we say? <laughs> yeah, and let moving on to the last question. Um, thanks so much for um, it's kind of been quite a, a long podcast this has, um, but it's been super fun. Um, yeah, in your opinion. <laughs> I, oh, I think all of it will Alex gonna have to edit it he's in long long hours for him <laughs> but um yeah last question in your opinion what makes a, a good snowboard instructor um patience um I think the biggest thing is what makes a good snowboard instructor is a good instructor first so someone who is able to um be patient enough to try different techniques and wait for that beautiful aha moment when your student gets it, when your student puts it all together to be involved in the craft of making a lesson that is designed towards that aha moment. And if you're the kind of person that's going to celebrate in your student's success and seeing them just click and fall in love with what you fell in love with, if you can celebrate that, if you love that, that's what makes a good instructor. Someone who cares as much about their student's success and their student's turns as their own turns. That's so good. Um, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, before we kind of uh, finish this episode, is there anything um, in terms of contacts we, um, you kind of want to um, plug in in terms of Cassie itself or, or, or a person yourself to get in touch if anyone does want to get in touch 
Um, well, you can find all of our Cassie information on our Cassie website, which is www.casi-acms, that's the French one, dot com. Um, and all of our, our videos and our content is freely available on YouTube as well. Um, and so we, we're in the business of sharing and educating. So get some, get some extra education and see some of our content. Um, and you can also find information and links to uh, the Ricky Academy in New Zealand. Hopefully we can be up and running and running courses um, in New Zealand as well as in our other locations all over the world um, in future years. It's really nice to see Cassie go global and I'd love to see that continue. Amazing, thank you.